I'm Jason Wright, and this is the Texas Titans Podcast. Just like the name of the podcast suggests, I will be visiting with Texas Titans of business, academia, sports, or whatever their chosen field, looking for the disciplines and habits that have made these Texans so remarkable. Success leaves clues, and I want to crack the code to these Titans' success and share it with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Texas Titans Podcast. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Texas Titans Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I have a great show for you guys today. I had the opportunity to sit down with Atlanta Braves pitcher Josh Tomlin, who also happens to be a fellow East Texan from White House, Texas. This was one of my favorite interviews by far. You're going to find out exactly why Josh has been able to maintain a 14-year career in the big leagues, which in and of itself is a remarkable feat. Uh, some of the wisdom that he dispels during this interview is truly remarkable, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of that and understand why uh, this guy is truly special. So I really think you'll enjoy it. Josh started out, like I said, at White House as a high school standout. Then he went to Angelina College and in five Finally, finished his collegiate career at Texas Tech. He was drafted by the San Diego Padres and then went over to the Cleveland organization where he has spent the bulk of his professional career. He actually played on the 2016 World Series team. And now he's with my beloved Atlanta Braves. And again, I can't tell you how much I enjoy this interview. I hope that you enjoy it as much as I did. And by the way, please excuse a little bit of noise in the background every once in a while. I recorded this in my home office, and we were having some work done, so you may hear some grinding in the back. It's not a big deal. No one was harmed during the uh, recording of this podcast, I assure you, Uh, but anyway, if you hear something, just please forgive me for that, and uh, also a special congratulations to Josh and Carly Tomlin, who are expecting their first little boy. They've got two girls, now they've got a little boy. So there's going to be another Tomlin in the bullpen. So really excited about that. And by the way, if you have a little one, or if you want to buy Josh and Carly a gift for their upcoming little boy, then please go to Hot Tots, our sponsor for today in Tyler, Texas on Old Bullard Road, right behind Broadway Square Mall. The best way to, if you don't want to come in, go to Instagram and follow Hot Tots, where they are constantly posting specials and deals and new arrivals. And literally, all you have to do, follow Hot Tots on Instagram. You'll find everything you want right there. If you see something you like, just send a DM directly to Jimlin or one of the girls, and they will get back to you and take care of it. They will ship it to you, whatever you need. Hot Tots is the sponsor today. All that's like I've said before. From newborn to preteen and everything in between, hot tots. So, hope you'll check them out. I hope you enjoy this interview with Atlanta Braves pitcher Josh Tomlin. Guys, thank you so, so much for listening. Have an awesome day. Get out there. Do something truly titanic. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Texas Titans podcast. This episode is brought to you by Office Pride. If you have a commercial business, a commercial office, physician's office, insurance office, real estate office, I don't care what kind of office you have. It gets dirty throughout the course of business. And guess what? If you're a physician, you need to be taking care of your patients. If you're an insurance agent, you need to be writing insurance policies. If you're a real estate agent or a real estate broker, you need to be selling houses or selling or or, or, or writing leases or doing anything other than cleaning your office space. That's why you need Office Pride. My friend David Stein is the East Texas developer for Office Pride. And he is also one of the top franchisees in the entire Office Pride family of franchises. And he's right here in East Texas. And I cannot more highly recommend both David as a leader and Office Pride, the company that he runs right here in East Texas. Give him a call at 903-534-0425, 903-534-0425, or just go to officepride.com. If you're outside the East Texas area, there's probably an Office Pride near you. Check them out. And when you do so, please, please, please mention that you heard about them on the Texas Titans podcast. David is uh, David Stein, 
our local East Texas developer. Not only is a good friend, but he is a Texas Titan, a great entrepreneur, a great friend. And I can tell you, he runs his business with the utmost of integrity. They do a great job. He makes sure that they do the job they say they're going to do, when they're going to do it. And if something goes wrong, because, hey, that's business, he's going to take care of it. So you can always depend on Office Pride. So please, 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 please call Office Pride for all your commercial cleaning needs. All right. Well, I just hit the red button. So we are officially on record and I'm here with Major League Baseball pitcher Josh Tomlin. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, guys. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. And I am so excited. I'm probably going to be like grinning through this entire interview because like I, I'm so excited for a number of reasons. One, you know, you're my first pro athlete on the Texas Titan podcast. So that's pretty cool. But then also, man, you're a brave, you know, you were, you were, you were an Indian for so many years, but now you're a part of the Atlanta Braves, my favorite team growing up because, you know, I'm significantly younger than you, like we talked about. And back in the day, the Rangers weren't what they are now. And the media being what it is, there wasn't as many outlets. So literally, they didn't draw the crowds to get on TV. And with the Superstation, TBS, the Atlanta Braves, because Ted Turner owned the Braves. So you got to see all the Braves games. So I grew up watching the Braves. And so I am so excited to have an, a, a live actual Atlanta Brave that's from East Texas on the podcast, man. So thanks for doing this. Well, I appreciate you having me. Uh, yeah, the Braves were that kind of team, right? Like Everybody kind of rooted for them when they were younger because they they were the only team, them and the Chicago Cubs, WGN. All yeah. The teams that were really like televised in, in areas that you wouldn't expect them to be televised. Well, and it kind of goes to show you, you know, Josh, hey, if you got a billion dollars and a TV station <laughs> and you own a team, you get to be on whether you're good or not. Because back That's in right. the, cause that was back, I was literally just looking, like I told you before we got on the air, uh, I was looking back. You were born in 1984. So I was looking at, the 84 Braves lineup, which man, that was, that was my Braves. I was nine years old and that's, you know, uh, Rafael Ramirez, that's Chris Chambliss, Glenn Hubbard, uh, Joe Torrey was coaching the Braves at that time. Uh, well, Del- I, yeah, he was. oh yeah, yeah. Torrey was, you know, he was with the Braves like through most of my childhood. That's, that's what, it, well, through my younger years, you know, before the glory days started and, um, and, then uh, Dale Murphy, you know, that's back when Dale was like, you know, crushing back to back MVP titles yeah. and just. He's an icon around here. Well, awesome. let me, okay, this is a true story, Josh. And then I'm going to say, I told you I was going to be like a little kid. I'm doing all the talking. I'm supposed to be asking you questions. I love, no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, so like, I kid you not, I used to, and if you've ever watched Dale Murphy, you know, from back whenever he was playing, I used to literally mimic his not only his swing and his stance but the the ever before every pitch tap the plate twice do the little the little swipe right uh-huh. and then then get set up i would do that and and my, my dad and everybody would laugh at me and say look he's doing his del murphy thing but i kid you so so here's what i would do i would and this went all through high school and and it is me playing baseball as long as I did, which was my favorite sport. I was a diehard baseball nut back then. But literally what I would do is unless I had two strikes, I would choke up and then I'd go into like a little right-handed Wade Boggs action, you know, uh-huh. where just to try to make contact. But other than that, man, I was literally mimicking Dale Murphy's stance the whole time with the the, the, pre, the little pre pitch swipe, all of it. And so <laughs> it's a pretty good one to mimic, though. Oh, dude, he could crush it. He was so awesome. I mean, that's how that's how ninety five percent of the guys that you see from Latin America that come over here, uh, yeah, are Carlos Santana. Everything you, everything he does is Victor Martinez. Yeah, you can just watch it and you can see. Yeah, and you see that guys um, Lindor trying to be Carlos Viagra or. Um, an Alomar brother. Trying to, you can just see it in him. Like they watched this guy grow up, and it was a significant part of his life in baseball. And they make that turn, and they're like, "That's the guy I want to be." And they yeah. just continue to try to be that guy, and they come here, and they are that guy. Absolutely, it's a different version. Absolutely. Well, and let's uh, okay. So let's stop making this the the Jason Wright nostalgia hour. <laughs> yeah, this is the Texas Titan podcast, and you are today's Titan that we're featuring. So let's actually get into the the meat and potatoes of the interview. So Josh Tomlin from White House, Texas. 
take me back to, you know, growing up, when did baseball become a thing? I mean, like back in my day, we started out playing Dixie, Dixie League, and then you go to Little League, Pony League. And the and I know this is going to be different for you. I can already answer this question, but I want you to talk a little bit about it. Growing up in Sulphur Springs, not too far from you, uh, we didn't have as many options. I mean, essentially, you know, these kids today and probably when you were growing up, they play baseball year round. I mean, it's just, it never stops for us. It was summer league baseball. And then if you were good enough, you played, you went through the all-stars and then you played American Legion ball. And that was about it. And then I guess it was around my junior year, they started the winter leagues, you know, which a lot of my friends would come over to Tyler and play ball. And so they could get some fall and winter baseball in. So take me back to you growing up and kind of your early adolescent career as a ball player and what that looked like. It was, I wanted to play baseball from the time I can remember. And, and my dad and mom will, will mimic that same, same um, sentence. But it's, I just, it's always been something about it. And we always played at the White House, the Little League Park and White House. Um, I think it was like TTAB was the organization they called it at the time. And, but that's the only place I've really played from growing up from four years old till about probably my freshman year in high school. And that's when I started going and playing a couple – couple of uh, summer games or um, um, fall games and things like that. But I never had a set team for that, like summer league or fall league or anything like that. I always wanted to play different sports. Right. And my dad was pretty adamant about wanting me to play different sports. And I never understood at the time. I enjoyed other sports and wanted to play them, but I'd, I'd rather just play baseball. But mm-hmm. um, he was just trying to get me to be athletic. That way, you know, the more athletic you are, the, more, you know, the better – chances you are to becoming a better player and didn't know at the time but that was kind of what he was kind of instilling in me but um I, I don't know there was something about baseball that i didn't need i didn't need people to be around if i had a tennis ball if i had a rag ball i could throw it up against the wall and catch it and throw it against the wall and catch it and you know with the basketball if i have a basketball hoop or um i lived too, too close to the street so if the ball went in the road i was done game over so i couldn't play anymore but um i don't know man baseball I started playing. I was four years old for um, the we're the, we're the Warriors, and mm-hmm. um, been the Warriors since uh, I played high school ball. But <laughs> my dad always coached me, um, and just from the time I was four years old, I fell in love with it. Every second of it, every thing about it. Right. And so, when did now we're. Of course, I guess you probably started in uh, – we didn't have T-ball when I was growing up. We call, What we call was minor league, and it was coach pitch from day one. T-ball didn't even exist whenever I was a kid. Really? So, yeah. So did you start T-ball, then minor league with coach pitch, and then – Yeah. Well, we never had, we never had coach pitch. Oh, okay. It was, it was weird because like, I see it now, how it works now. It's like – well, how it works when I was playing. It was, you were four to six or seven years old, I think is what it was, and then from the time you were eight, nine, ten on up, it was kid pitch. Right. Uh, it was straight kid pitch from the time you left T ball, and, yeah. and I see it now. And it's like you have T ball, then you have coach pitch, then you have player coach pitch. In case like you have the player can pitch till two strikes or something like that. I think it was four four balls, and then he has the coach has to come pitch. Um, but it was yeah, that's how that's exactly how it was for me. T ball for I started pretty young, so I had to play T ball for like. Two uh, extra, maybe an extra year than everybody else had to play it. Right. But then when I got moved up, um, I was one of the younger kids getting moved up, so I was always one of the younger kids playing with all the older kids. And um, but I like that because I got to stay in that level for two years instead of just going one year and having to go to the next level. Right. Right. And I would venture a guess that uh, you probably because you're you're a pitcher in the major leagues and people don't know this they don't they forget that pitchers had a a high school career and a little league career. I bet you probably batted what third or fourth in the lineup. Where did you bat? Or or lead off? I was yeah, I was usually one or two. Okay, okay. Yeah, we had uh, we had another guy, Travis Chick, um, who's actually from yeah. my house. Yeah. Um, and he he was all he's, he's going to watch this and, and and rub this in my face, but he was always our three hole hitter, four hole hitter. Yeah. Some pop, he hit the ball at the ballpark. Yeah. I really couldn't hit the ball with the fence, so there, I was more of a get on base for Travis to drive you and that guy. But you were a contact hitter. And, Absolutely, and, yeah. and, and so that's what I think is interesting that a lot of people, because they see in the major leagues where all you do is pitch and you don't get the the trips to the plate, so they think, oh, this guy, he's just not a hitter. And, he pro-, and they, right. don't, they don't realize that if you are a major league pitcher, that means that you were probably 
a great, you know, hitter at, at, at a younger age. And the reason why I asked that is because, so when did you start pitching? And then, of course, you know, how it is whenever you're growing up little league, anybody that can chunk and get it over the plate. And so if you've got heat and you get over the plate, you're going to probably pitch. But then it's somewhere around, I would say, for us, some of the guys that were really advanced pony league, so I guess that kind of 10, 11-year-old, they start being able to, you know, throw some junk, you know, a, a decent right. curveball, maybe a slider or something like that. But then it's high school where the guys start really developing beyond just being a chunker that can throw heat. When was it for you that you realized, okay, I can, I'm not just a good – contact hitter with an arm, but I've got the mechanics and the tools that kind of separate me from the rest of the pack. I, I honestly, the, the honest answer to that is, is college is right. Whenever I got drafted by the San Diego Padres, mm-hmm. 11th, 11th round of 2005. Yep. I was, I was always a shortstop, um, middle infield hitting two hole in at, um, junior college. And my whole my whole process was I'm gonna go I'm gonna go play a position until someone makes me pitch. I, I knew I could pitch. I knew I could come in. I, could, I was a thrower. Only thing really? I could do is just throw the ball to the plate. I I could manipulate the baseball however I want to, but I really had no idea what I was doing. Okay. I just they told me to go pitch because you can throw strikes. Go pitch. Okay. Right. Cool. And I never really threw hard. I was 88 to 92, maybe touch 93 every now and again. Um, but. It was whenever I got drafted by the Indians in 2006. Didn't sign with the Padres. They drafted me as a position player. I knew I was too small. I needed to go to Texas Tech, get bigger, stronger. Um, kind of have that one more year of development before I went there. Because I don't want to go in there, but, you know, going there blind to play in position. Sure. And you go, you know what? I, I, if I don't hit home runs, I'm, I'm out of the game. Right. So I wanted to go get bigger and just get one more year of advanced um, under my belt. And, the Indians drafted me in the 19th round the year after that in 06. And they said, Hey, we're you're doing nothing but pitch now. I was like, that's, that's, that's an interesting move. I've, I've never, <laughs> no one's ever told me they want me to be just a pitcher before. So right. it was, I had, I had a lot of great help, you know, by my side. I had Philip Umber, my dad, um, Travis Chick, Robert Ellis, um, Glenn Graves. There's countless people I can sit here and think, but once, once I got in the pro ball, those three guys, Robert Ellis, Travis Chick, and, and, and Philip Umber, had played there before. Right. They'd been in the minor leagues. And, yep. um, some of them had been in the big leagues. So it was like one of those things they just kind of like, hey, this is this is how you go about your business. This is how you, you know, throw bullpen. This is how you get ready for a game. This is how you start. They, things like that. They, 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 they guided me along the way. So um, here's your routine, you know. Like, I, I remember Philip Umber was going to Bobby Stroop at the time. It was when Bobby Stroop was living in a – not living, but working out in a place behind – um, a, a, I can't remember where it was at the time, but he had like a little barn gym. We yeah, one there and, and, and the one on out. New Copeland Road, the the one before the yeah. big. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so like we were some of Philip was probably the first, but we were some of Bobby's very first clients to come yeah. in the door. And um, so it was like they, those guys did, did so much for me that they they probably don't even realize they did. They're just being genuine people, and it just kind of sets you up for for. A, you know, going in the direction of having a routine and it just helped me mold into a pitcher quicker, I guess. So it was a transition wasn't very difficult for me, but it was, it was something I had to get just kind of buy into, I should say. Not yeah. instead of like, you know, try to keep fighting and like I can play shortstop. I can, I can still play. I can hit a little bit. No, you, you go pitch and do your thing on the mound <laughs> because you're probably not, you probably weren't going to be very successful as a position player. I had to find, I had to find that and, and understand that and accept that. Wow. So, and so what's that transition like? I mean, when, did a light bulb come on to whenever you f- started developing as a pitcher and started to realize yourself? I mean, they obviously saw in you, okay, this kid's got the mechanics. We know we can make a right. picture of him. He's got that in him. We just got to hone it. Whenever you started to realize you were capable of more than just getting the ball over the plate, you know, at a, at a decent velocity, did that start to make you go, did you, was that, I mean, what was that like? Yeah, it was, it was literally like a light bulb goes off in your head, like, oh, I can do this. Right. I, 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 and you finally realize, um, I, I think for me it was, I would always start the year in the bullpen every year. Um, I was never a high prospect guy. I was never a high priority guy coming up. I was drafted for minimal money. Um, second day of the draft, I wasn't a high high profile guy. And I'd gotten hurt a little bit at Texas Tech the year before. But I remember – 
pitching. It was in high A, and I was throwing two innings every other day. Then we traded away our closer, and they put me in the closing role. And I was closing games, and I was like, I never expected to be a closer either. So right. now I'm closing games at a high A um, level, which is a, so you're starting to get to a level where you can kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel. You're double A, triple A, big leagues away. Um, and they was like, hey, the Indians call up. Brought me to the office sometimes and said, hey, you're going to start in two days. Okay, cool. Made one start. And they're like, hey, you're going to start in AAA the next day. Or the next start. Your next start will be in AAA. I was like, what in the heck? <laughs> so I flew to, flew to Buffalo, New York, fished in AAA, did seven innings there. And I was like, you know what? This is only one level below the big leagues. And I was able to, to pitch well. Right. And uh, so it's kind of like at that point, then I went to the Arizona Fall League that year where all the prospects get to go. So I, it kind of gave me that confidence of going, like, they believe in me. They trust in me. And, you know, as little as that may be, like, they probably weren't thinking of, you know, hey, let's send our one of our prospects to Arizona Fall League. It was just to give me more innings because I right. only pitched out of the bullpen that year. Right. And it, it, it gave me confidence going, okay, they, they do believe in me. They trust me. They, 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 they want to see how good I can get. So that was a – kind of a boost of energy and a boost of like, hey, go show them what you're made of and, and try to try to format uh, a, like a foundation for them that, that they trust you. So it was like, okay, cool. And that confidence kind of, it kind of goes off in your head and you go, okay, maybe I am as good as I, I feel like I can be. And right. they see it too. So I, I do have a chance to pitch in the big leagues. It just kind of goes off and you're just like, oh, I'm <laughs> not too far away. And then right. you see that light, it's just like, Take it and run with it. Well, okay, because that, that that's a perfect, perfect setup for kind of what the podcast is all about. And, and I love the fact that you're an athlete because it just as an athlete, there's there's the mental aspects, there's the psychology of it, there's the physical aspect of maintaining your body, your fitness, and your your mind, especially as a pitcher. I mean, my goodness. So you get to that point where given you're given the opportunity. So that gives you a boost of confidence. And you, as you said, the light bulb goes off that, okay, I could actually stand, I should go to the, I could possibly go to the show and stand before, you know, however many thousands of people in a stadium pitch. Once that, that you start to see that as a true potential reality, how do you discipline yourself? What does your goal setting look like? What does, how does it change how you handle your day to day or does it, or do you just keep doing what you're doing, but with a little bit more, uh, I don't know, determination or purpose. What does that look like? What is your mind? How do you start to develop your habits after you come to that realization? I think, I think at that time you start to develop, a, a, you, you try to hone in a skill set. Okay. So you, you, you find out what you're good at and you start, you start saying what makes Josh Thomas good, you know, or, or, how can I be the best version of me if somewhere I get somewhere, I'm not changing who I am on a, on a regular basis. Baseball yeah. is a game of failure. If you can't accept failure, then you're probably going to have a hard time yeah. be, being, being able to stick in the game. Right. There's, there's an old saying, baseball, and a couple of them, baseball, there's those who are humble and those who are soon, soon to be humbled. Right. So if you, don't, if you don't ride that roller coaster and go up and down, up and down, up and down the whole time, you're trying to stay even kill as long as you can. Yeah because you're the best version of yourself, you understand who you are as a pitcher or a player, you have a better chance of sticking and staying. And I think that's what, that's what routines are. You try to get into a routine to where, okay, if I'm, if the off season comes, if I'm working out every day at six o'clock, I'm going to work out every day at six o'clock. I want my body to feel that, that feeling of, okay, every day you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Right. Because baseball is no different. It's, you're at the ballpark on a tonight. We have a seven o'clock game. I'll be at the ballpark at one thirty. So it's it's not like you're. It, it, that doesn't change. If it changes because it's it's raining outside, we had a long game the day before, and like, hey, show up at four o'clock today. And we're just going to show and go. We're not hitting on the field. There's a lot of things that go into it, but you go you go there and you're doing the same exact thing day in day out. The monotony of it is is crazy, but it's just a reality of, of yeah. the sport. So um, the more you can kind of hone that routine in the better chance you have of being consistent throughout the course of that, you know, understanding of who you are and things like that. It makes you a more consistent player, right? right. That's, that's the whole thing about the big league. The people that stay are the ones that can do, do it and repeat it on a consistent level. So that was, you know, that's it's kind of how you try to treat your body. And, and then once you know, you have a chance to get to the big leagues and you know, that reality is there. Now it's treating it as a job. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to go in there and you, if you, if, 
I'm trying to think of an example. So if, if I worked at if I worked at Hot Tots, yep. you know, from nine to five, right. and I showed up at ten o'clock every day and left at four o'clock every day, but my schedule was nine to five, I'm probably going to get fired pretty soon. I'm not right. doing my job the right way. So baseball is no different. You still have to treat it as a job, even though it's a game. You're, they're still paying you money to go out there and perform. Right. So now you have to treat it like that. Is okay. Um, have a day. I have to work out. I need to work out. Right. Don't go in there late. Don't go in there and half butt it. Just go in there and do it and, and, and get it over with. It's your job. The more you can understand, enjoy it as a game. Don't get me wrong. I love every second of that. I still to this day love every second of it. Um, but you also have to treat it as a job and, and, and respect it and, and, and earn the right to stay where you're at. Wow. So that's, and that you just said something that I think is so profound in business and in anything. And it's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is that, you know, uh, for years I've been a business guy. You know, you mentioned some names, uh, Robert Ellis, you know, Jody, uh, was one of my agents for years, his wife. And then we, and Jody, when she was an agent, sold Philip Umber his first house after he signed his first contract. So oh, I, nice. and so I, I, I knew Philip a little bit, but I really knew Robert. Incredible guy, great coach. You know, I mean, he was obviously awesome. a, a good pitcher himself, but man, great coach. So it's so cool to hear those names that I haven't seen Robert Ellis in so many years. So it's so cool to hear you bring him up. But what you were saying is so applicable in business or any aspect of life. So, you know, I've been a business guy all these years, and what I had to figure out was what I was good at. And one of the things now I'm kind of that stage of life where, okay, it's trying to match what. I think I'm pretty good at with what I love, which is communicating, like doing what we're doing. You know, I'm right. doing this as a passion project because I love meeting people. I love self education. I love learning from those who have achieved incredible things. And so I think that's so applicable, like you said. And by the way, Hot Tots, for those who don't know, is, is my wife's uh, children's boutique where the Tomlins uh, shop. And we're so grateful. And that's a perfect time to offer some congratulations because after two little girls, Josh and Carly Tomlin are about to have their first little boy. So, that's right. So congratulations from all of us at the Texas Titan Podcast, man. We're so happy for you guys. But yeah, I think that what you said is – and that that, that's just it because – and also one of the things I talk about a lot on the podcast is entrepreneurship, which is very much like what you just described. Being a professional athlete, it's not a quote-unquote um, – it's not your typical job per se, but it still requires discipline and the treatment like that. Same thing with an entrepreneur. If you own the business, right. some people think that, well – if you're an entrepreneur and you own the company, you can come and go as you please. You can take vacations when yeah. you want. Absolutely not. If you if you treat it like that, you will fail miserably. Not the good ones. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So so I think that's so applicable. Well, tell me this. Uh, just kind of uh, we'll get back into the real serious uh, learning aspects of this. But the minor leagues. What was that like? Because you know most people's vision of the minor leagues obviously is Bull Durham and you know riding broken down buses and or just it's it not just. Far off. Yeah, I mean, tell me, because I've heard some players talk about that experience. Give us kind of an idea of what a day in the life of a minor league ball player is like. It, it depends on, it depends kind of how, where you're at, what, 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 if you're in the lower levels to AAA. Some of these AAA ballparks nowadays, are they're, they're amazing. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. They're big league stadiums just to, without the third deck, and they're beautiful, <laughs> right? So, I mean, right. you're not really... You don't really sacrifice much, except for maybe um, benefits and insurance and stuff. Right. In the big leagues compared to AAA. Right. But um, some of these lower levels, there'll be there'll be a clubhouse, a shower, a clubhouse with no walls. <laughs> you're, the water's running off from the shower into the into your lockers. Um, some of them have um, dirt floors or no lockers. You're just hanging stuff on pipes. It's it, it's it's kind of a joke, but it's um, it's it, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's like boot camp, but I, uh-huh. I kind of compare it to like the army and the boot camp, right? So right. They're trying to weed out the ones that don't have it, don't want it, don't yeah. don't want that drive, don't can't handle that adversity of, of sleeping in a hotel room where you have two box springs instead of two mattresses, or <laughs> right. uh, you know things like that. It happens. I, I've walked into a room in Oneon in New York, and America's best value, America's value best, whatever it's called, and I go and just jump on my bed. I'm tired. We had a fourteen hour <laughs> bus trip. And had two box springs on it. I <laughs> broke my neck. I was like, what is going on here? I was like, someone, someone playing a prank. And the other one had a box spring and a mattress. So it was just some of those things you don't really, 
doesn't get talked about as much as, as there probably should be. And now nowadays, the game's going to a, a very useful game, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to the, the the age of the big leagues is is turning into the average twenty one to twenty three instead of twenty four twenty seven now, yeah, or twenty five twenty seven. And um, so they don't really experience minor leagues quite as much as some of the other guys have, have just probably experienced it. But um, it it does it teaches you it teaches you how to survive. It teaches you how to kind of get by on a daily basis whenever you have nothing but a Wawa to go find, you know, drinks and, and food and um, snacks. It's gas. It's a gas station. And that's how you're living your, that's how you're living your life. You yeah. need two meals a day at a gas station. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But you, that's what you're getting paid to do too. I mean, you're getting paid to, to go play, but you're getting paid 800 bucks every, every month. Right. You right. Know, it's, that's the whole, that's what a lot of people, it's funny. We'd be working out. Me, Travis, and Philip used to make a joke all the time is, People used to always ask you, when are you going to make it to the pros? It's like, I, I'm in the pros. I'm just in the minor league of the pros. Right. It, it's still the professional baseball. But um, it, it, as soon as you say that, they, they assume automatically, oh, he's making $10 million <laughs> in professional baseball. Right. Like, no, no, no. That's, that's not the case. Right. Uh, it's 800 bucks every month um, and 1600 bucks. Um, if you're lucky to hire you, if you go that year, if you get if you get to like the triple A's that year, you make. 1600 bucks like it we we'd we map it and you know you, you stay 60 days at a level you get an extra 500 hundred dollar bonus people were stoked about that <laughs> right but little things like that that you build some of the greatest friendships going through that you build some of the um the strongest character you, you build your character and things like that and i really believe that and um you go to a city that has you know it's like white house texas you go into white house texas and you have a minor league ballpark there and um you know, you have a church of chicken and a McDonald's to choose from. You know, right. Good luck. Right. Because you know, you're not going to the go- you're not going to the grocery store for three days and buying a ton of you know sandwich meat and chips and things like that because you really can't afford it. Right. <laughs> right. You're waiting to go on the dollar menu. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So let's talk about some of the mental aspect of that. So you you you're getting it. You understand. I'm still getting paid to pl- as an adult to play my childhood game. The the game that I you know, dreamed of playing professionally one day. How do you, was there ever a time where you thought I'm out 800 bucks a month? I want to get married, have a family. Maybe I do need to go back to East Texas or go somewhere, you know, go to work and do something more traditional. Was there ever that time or were you able to always bear in mind that I'm paying my dues, but I'm doing, I am breathing, even in the minor leagues, you're breathing, very rare air, right? There's just not many mm-hmm. people that get to that level in sports. So how was it for you mentally? And if you did have those tough times where you're like, man, this is just, this is, I'm out, you know, how did you keep yourself focused on remembering what the ultimate prize is and that you were, you actually had an opportunity, you made it farther than so many others. What was that mental aspect like? I think we all go through, right? We all go through like the negative aspect of, of anything. Yeah. You can try to find the bad and everything, right? Just, um, I would be sitting in hotel rooms thinking to myself sometimes, like, I, I don't know, I don't know that this is worth it. Mm-hmm. And, and to be honest with you, I'm a baseball junkie. I love it. I love every aspect of it. And I, I can tell you right now, 95% of my minor league career, I loved. Yeah. 5% of it was, was tough. It was the, you're struggling and you're in, you're in, you're in a, Del Marva in, on, in July, um, on July 4th, and there's 400 people watching the game. They're shooting off fireworks, and you can see people, you know, having their hot dogs and beers and, and celebrating the 4th of July. And, and I'm in, you know, I've given up five runs today. You're going, what am I doing? Like, I can, I know all my friends are back home on the lake, or yeah. um, my family's in the lake barbecuing and celebrating the 4th of July. And I'm here in a um, Motel 6 rundown place in Del Marva. Virginia and a river to Marvel was, I can't remember what it was actually, but I'm sitting there going like, where am I, where am I at? Why am I, why am I doing this? Right. And then you get to go to the ballpark the next day and it, it all kind of goes away. It yeah. is me. And it's, you, you, you once, once I, it's almost like sort of dream. And I hate saying that. I don't want to sound corny, but once I get on the baseball field, I'm in that locker room. I'm in the, in between the white lines. I'm in the dugout. That's, that's my, that's my time. That's yeah. my time to, that's my sanctuary. Yeah. It's time to put away all the negative feelings, put away all the bad things, good things. Everything goes away for two or three hours a day and, and I can hone in on doing one thing and that's play baseball. Right. So that's it's definitely, 
the minor leagues has a way of of testing guys to the limits of I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And, and probably ninety five percent of the people that don't have the Hall of Fame careers will tell you the exact same thing. The, the reason why they retired is because you know they didn't want to go have to go to AAA again mm-hmm. and, and stay for an extra one or two years just to get back to the big leagues. It was I don't want to go back there and and play for you know pennies on a dollar when I've made it's been in the big leagues for 10 years and you want to go to the minor leagues for a year to play. A lot of guys don't want to do that anymore. So they just, they're really never retiring. Right. And it's, but the minor leagues is, it's, it's, it's a great stepping stone for, for what you have to expect to get to the big leagues. Cause it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. People don't understand. Um, you know, we got into like last night, we got in at 10 30, 11 o'clock at night, which is an early day, early night for us getting in. We usually get in at, you know, three or four o'clock in the morning, traveling from from city to city, and have to play the next day. Which I get it. We're playing a game, right? But once this is your life, this is something you've done. This is my fourteenth year in yeah. doing this now, so it's it could become a grind for you every now and again. But um, it definitely minor leagues teaches you that because you got to throw me hell. You got to think you get on a bus trip. You're going for fourteen hours. Yeah, you get on a bus to or to travel to a city. Get off at six o'clock in the morning stretch your legs, go lay down for 30, 45 minutes, hour hopefully, and you're up yeah. eating breakfast and getting ready for your day. Right. It's tough. But yeah. the baseball part of it is very, very fun. And it's um, competition in the minor leagues is outrageous. It's outrageous. It. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, so man, you're, you're, you're throwing out all kinds of just great nuggets of wisdom like that 95, five I'm going to use. I mean, 95% of it you love, there was 5% you didn't. And you just focus on the 95, right. That you, right. That you love. And I think there's so many people that get caught in that same thing with a job. I mean, there's 95% of it they like, but they'll, they'll let the 5% drive their decisions. You know, I've been in, oh, yeah, yeah. I've been in things like that, you know, where, and we tend to, for some reason, like I heard this um, statistic one time that's kind of like negative versus positive for every one negative thing you hear, it takes 21 positive pieces of reinforcement, either verbal or something else to get you to get rid of the negative. Right. And cause we Isn't focus. So, yeah, yeah, it is. And, and like and what you said earlier, it, it totally made me think about this, uh, which has been said ad nauseum, but you're talking about that in baseball, you have to be able to accept that there are going to be losses. There are going to be t- times of defeat, and but if you can overcome that, I mean, if I can, if I'm a hitter and I can be successful thirty percent of the time, I can make millions and millions of dollars, right? And you're gonna go down. You're gonna get S in <laughs> immortality. In right. Game. Right. And all I gotta do is thirty percent of the time. So that sh- time. so that shows you one the difficulty of what you're mm-hmm. faced with, but also. It's focusing on that small percentage of of what's going right that can make mm-hmm. the key difference. So that's awesome, man. Well, okay. So so there's a little bit of color of, you know, kind of your the way you process those those tough years. So now let's get you all right, you're you're right there. You've realized I'm gonna hone my skills as a pitcher. They have given me they they said this is what you're gonna do, and you've accepted it, you realized. I can do this. Now I'm going to develop the tools that make Josh Tomlin stand out as a pitcher. Then all of a sudden, take me to the day that you find out you're going to the bigs. When was it? What was the game? What was the year? And just how how does that how does that just take over your mind and everything? What is what does that day look like? It's, it's like God was watching over me that year. For, for whatever reason, he had he had he had my back. I, I'm pitching in AAA in 2010. Um, had some issues go on that were shouldn't have been going on. They were going they were going on at the time uh, with a couple few of my teammates. But my parents come and they bring my little cousin Logan Logan, Logan Barker. They they all come up there and they they come to watch me pitch in Columbus in AAA. And I'd be, I'd have a pretty good year that year. I think I had like two two ERA whenever I got called up. Um, and one of our um, hitting coaches, uh, Lee May Jr., I was in the shower. He comes in and he's like, uh, Tomlin, come here. I need to talk to you. And then we had um, Chris Trimmy was our manager um, at the time. Um, they, 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 I'd been with these guys from the time I was been in like high A all the way to or low way all the way till now. So I, I built a relationship with all these, these hitting coaches, pitching coaches, 
all the guys that were in the minor leagues, they coached me all the way up. It was kind of cool, but um, which doesn't happen very often. I've, I've come to realize seeing that and how, but so I'll, we were fortunate. Our group was pretty fortunate to be able to do that, but uh, they call you in there and um, it's usually, Hey, you're going to the big leagues, you're pitching tomorrow. And they told me like, Hey, you're pitching on Wednesday. I think it was a Wednesday, um, July 24th or 27th, July 27th. So I was like, I know. What, what do you mean? <laughs> but no, you need to go pack your stuff. You're not pitching here. You're pitching against the Yankees. It's like <laughs> the Yankees, the, the Scranton, the Scranton Wilkes Bear. The Yankees coming in. They're like, no, no, no. In Cleveland. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> they're like, congratulations. This and, that. and so, you know, everybody's giving me hugs. And, um, about before you leave, they say, Hey, you can't tell anybody. I was like, what, what do you mean? You can't, you can't tell anybody. Cause that's, that's three days, four days away. Um, they, they're not sending anybody down yet from uh, Cleveland, the big team, the major league team. And they don't want anybody to kind of, they don't want people to know you, you're coming up yet because there's a corresponding move, trades and things like that. Just keep, keep it quiet. Said, okay, cool. Uh, Charlie Nagy was a pitching coach at the time. One of my all-time favorites. Uh, came up to me and said, um, you're telling people, right? I said, no, man. I guess I'm, Chuck, I, I can't tell anybody. He goes, your parents and your mom and dad and your little cousins, you're telling them tonight. Tell them. Take them to dinner. Like, I, I, I was just told not to. He goes, I don't care what anybody told you. <laughs> that is your folks. But this is one of the biggest days of your entire life. You can't keep that in for three days before you go up there. Right. Tell your folks. And I did. And it was it was so cool because I was in the car and my dad was like, so who you got next? Who are you pitching against? I was like, funny you should ask that, dad. And I started telling him, he's like, what? It just ex- oh my ecstatic. gosh, I can't imagine. It was imagine. one of the coolest moments I was able to tell my parents face to face that I got a chance to go to Big Leagues. And then they were there to be able to just drive that short two hours from Columbus to Cleveland and come watch me pitch. And it was against the defending world champs and CC Sabathia. A Rob was going for a 600 home run. He had Jeter <laughs> going for like 3,000 hits. I was like, what in the hell? No pressure, man. Pitch? No pressure yeah. at all. And I didn't know any of this stuff when I got there. I was just oblivious to it. And, and I think that was, you know, blinded by the love of, of a playing baseball, I guess. But the simple fact of the matter was, was my dad was like, I got the Yankees. He's like, all right. He's like, you think they put their pants on any different than you? Like, oh, I hope they don't. <laughs> if they do, it's kind of cool. I don't know how they <laughs> well, do it. Right. <laughs> He's like, Josh, they've had to go through the same steps you've had to go through. It's just they – they're older than you. Yeah, they've been. They've, they've done the things you've done. They just stayed in the, uh, the big leagues longer, or been in the big leagues longer. Don't 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 let don't make them out to be some kind of person or player that they're really not. Don't don't make them titans already. I use the word titans. <laughs> there you go. Titans, right? Uh, Texas Titans, but they're not someone bigger than you. They're they're not. Just go out there and pitch your game. If you weren't good enough to be there, you wouldn't be there. Right. And I was like, man, that's, it's so true, but. Um, you never think that you never, I wish, I wish every, I wish every minor league player that got their first call to the big leagues could have some kind of electrodes hooked up to their brain because that feeling, if you could mimic that feeling, have it every day, it would be, it would be the greatest selling, not, it wouldn't be a narcotic <laughs> because it's a good feeling. It's, right. it's, not, it's like killing you to have this kind of right. like, over that, that joy. It was one of the best days of my entire life and um you know behind getting married and um having two beautiful daughters and and stuff like that it's it's right up there with it oh i can't imagine so okay so then the question becomes i mean how do you harness that because to me that's one of the things that separates you from the 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 guy that we'll never see on the mound in the major leagues is that it's overwhelming. First of all, it's had to be, it, like, as you described, that's a, that's a joyous, overwhelming moment, but you've got to go out there and you've got to kind of dismiss all that and just mm-hmm. do the job. How did you do that? Was it cognitive or did you just settle in? I mean, did you sit down and go, okay, I've got to get this together. What's that process like? Uh, to be a hundred percent honest with you, it's, it's, Guys will tell you all different types of things because they probably remember all different types of things that go on in their head over the course of, you know, two or three days of, of the, of the, of their debut. Right. There's a lot of things that go in your head and you think about it and you go, hmm, I, 
either fix it or, or what, how am I going to do this? Or, or what are the questions they're going to ask me if I do bad? What are the questions they're going to ask me if I do good? That's all leading up to the actual start. When I got there, I didn't, I knew maybe one person on the team. I wasn't in big league camp with the Indians. I wasn't, um, I'd never pitched in the big league prior to that. And I'd, only one person was called up from my AAA team on that team that year. So I, I knew one person on that team and it was Frank Herman. Um, so when I got there, it was just, you know, kind of find him, talk to him and things like that and just try to settle down. But um, once you, once you step between the lines, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a different feeling. It's, I, I don't really know how to expect, how to explain it except for the fact of you, you know, you have to do it. Mm-hmm. it you can't be afraid of failure. And, and that's a hell of a lot easier said than done. I get, I get it. But um, we talked about that earlier. Baseball is a game of failure. And I've, and I've never been, I've never been scared to fail. I've always, I've always been that underdog top player to a point where I had nothing to lose. I had everything to gain. I had basically my future was put in my hands and said, take it and run with it or take it, throw it, flush it down the commode and, and, and don't, you'll never be back. That's kind of how, not, not how I was treated, but how the status of me being drafted, that's how you're kind of treated. Right. You know, you're not a high money guy, not a prospect guy. So you get a chance to either take it and run with it or you take it and you kind of, you know, for lack of better terms, poop down your leg and you don't get to go back. Again, right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it was like, I just wanted to enjoy every aspect of that moment. when And I got to have my family there. I got to have my mom, my dad, my little cousin um, to watch to watch me pitch on the, the <laughs> day that I finally achieved my dream. So yeah. it was kind of one of those things where I was like, you know what, go, go have fun with it, but focus, compete, and see what happens. And it was, it was exactly that. It was, you go out there and you compete and you go, my first pitch I threw was Derek Jeter. I, I threw a fastball and I was almost hit him in the neck. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. I wanted to apologize to him out there. Like, I'm sorry, Mr. Jeter. I'm sorry. But I was like, you know what? The, I'm competing against you right now. Yeah. You're not one of my favorite players. Actually, you're my enemy. So I'm trying to get you out. Next pitch, got him to pop up and everything. You kind of settle in. That's exactly, you said the word earlier. You settle in to the point where, all right, this is just a baseball game. Just go play. Yeah. You know, you yeah. imagine yourself being 12 years old playing baseball. Yeah. Right? And go do it. Yeah. And then let the results be what they are. But the fact that I, I, I think knowing who, knowing, knowing who you are as a pitcher is a great thing. But knowing who you are from a mental aspect, from a toughness aspect, from a gamer, from a competitiveness aspect is probably the most, from a mental aspect, that's the most important aspect of the game of baseball at this point in my career. And at this point in anybody's career, in my, in my opinion, because let's be honest, if you're getting called to the big leagues, you're good. Yeah. You're very good. Yeah. There's, there's not too many people that go by the model of, hey, let's just bring this guy because <laughs> right. he, he stinks. Yeah. Right. You know, it's right. not happening. Um, so the, the more you can practice and, and hone in your mental capabilities and apply them to baseball, because it is, it's a game of failure. The more you can apply that to that game, the better you're going to be. And more, have, more you have a chance to stay and actually making a career out of it. Right. So do you have a pregame ritual before you're going to take the mound? Uh, if I was when I was a starter, yeah. 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 What did you, uh, and uh, there's two questions, two part question. One, what is something that, you did before that very first game where you pitched in the bigs that you continue to do as a starter. And then you then kind of take me to what the final, like this is on, on game day, whenever Josh is taking the mound to start the game, this is going to happen every day. So kind of take me from that first one, the things that you did then that you did throughout the whole time to what, what did the final process look like before you took the mound? It's, this is going to sound weird. And I, 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 you know, we've heard all kinds of crazy baseball stories, man, about <laughs> things that people do. So I, 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 I don't anything's too weird, man. So, so bring it. I used to eat, like the day I pitched, I can't eat. It's hard for me. To, it, when I was a starter, it's hard for me to eat. Yeah. Um, it was a real issue for me. And so I usually just either drank a, a protein shake 30, 40 minutes before I went on the field and I was good. Right. Um, that was in the minor league. But I actually had two five guys burgers a day for my, um, the day of my uh, start, my very first major league start, two five guys burgers, um, and I pitched well. <laughs> I had two five guys burgers on every start day for up until shoot 2000, 
16, 17 maybe. Really? For six years. And if it was, if I wasn't around the five guys in the big league, or, uh, in the big league stadium or hotel, I'd have to stop and see like an In-N-Out burger or a uh-huh. water burger or something like that. But it was always a hamburger. Yeah. And I can remember, I think it was 17, I was pitching and I started getting cramps. I was like, what is going on? Why, why am I getting cramps in my calves and my hamstrings and stuff right now? And I was in the condition coach. I was like, what's going on with you? I was like, I don't know. I'm not doing anything different. I said, what did you eat today? I had two Five Guys burgers. He's like, what? <laughs> said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I've been doing this for six years, seven years. He's like, exactly. You're not 24 anymore. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't go eat two Five Guys burgers and expect to come out here and perform on a daily basis and, and, and not cramp up anymore. You're yeah. 32 years old. 32 years old. I was like, really yeah they does that to you and it's like yeah it does but that was something i did for quite a long time but now it's uh, um it's the same i have the same sweater i have the same i, I mark my jersey i mark my pants i mark my socks really with a dot or like i'll put a g on my pants for game pants we had three or four sets of game uh, pants uh-huh. Those pants will always be for the game, not <laughs> practice, not anything else. It's for the game. Right. Um, same socks, same cleats, same everything until, you know, until you struggle. When you struggle for a little bit, then you go, you know what, it's time to make a change and do something else. But um, that's usually the main thing that I try to do. Is all, the same thing I wear the day, the first day I pitch, the same thing I wear every single day until the season's over with. Wow. You know, you see a lot of guys changing things or, you know, I might go pants up on like a, a cool jersey day or a cool sock day or uh-huh. a cool, like, you know, um, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, things like that. But for the most part, it's the same. Eat at the same time. You, um, you know, like for me, coffee. I'll go down the first thing, have a coffee, sit there, watch the game, talk to Marty Reed and the bullpen guys for the first three innings, um, you know, watch how the game's developing, and then you kind of just kind of slowly but surely start moving around, getting ready, and – um, so coffee in the first inning, Red Bull in the fifth inning, and then you're good to go. <laughs> but as a starter, you, you have a, you have a little bit more set routine, right? Yeah. I mean, you have the the same thing. You know when you're pitching, you know when you're throwing a bullpen, things like that. But um, so it's a little bit easier to stick in the same routine on a constant basis. But as a bullpen guy, you never know when you're pitching, so you do right. the same thing over and over and over again. Right. Right. So what's the craziest thing that you've ever seen that uh, the craziest ritual that any of your teammates have had that you've seen through the years? I'm trying to think, uh, there's a, there's a lot of crazy things that I've heard and I probably should mention, I won't mention names <laughs> on uh, who did this, but, uh, like taking, taking shots to like crown Royal or, um, <laughs> you know, something like that before they go out there or have a six pack of, of Bud Light or, or, or Miller Light underneath in the yeah. um, clubhouse or in the um, dugout just so they can get to the game. I go down there and crack open a beer in the second inning, start drinking and just calm the nerves and kind of calm them down. I've seen all kinds of stuff like that from that to, to sprinting to the mound from the outfield. Yeah. Um, it's some of the things you see, um, you know, like <laughs> – we were struggling a little bit in, I think it was 2012, October 13, where he said we were going to sacrifice a live chicken. And um, <laughs> our, PR, our PR guy was like, no, you're not. No, you are not. Guy. Like, the, the movie Major League. Major like, League, yeah, exactly. We're just trying to mimic this to get us to start winning some games. Man. We lost like 20 games in the month of August. And we're like, you're sacrificing a chicken. Like, you're not sacrificing a chicken. <laughs> On TV. Like Serrano, did they so did they bring you a bucket of fried chicken instead, like they did for Serrano to make up for it? No, so what we did, we got Cody Allen, who um, had an unbelievable career with Cleveland, and uh, he's with Minnesota Twins right now. Um, one of our close, one of me and my wife's closest friends, um, him and his wife Mallory, they have a little boy now, uh, Kaysen, live in uh, South Lake, Texas, South Lake Carroll now. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. He was a rookie at the time, so like Cody. You're gonna wear a chicken suit for BP. It's like what? A what? A chicken suit. You're gonna wear a chicken suit for batting practice, and so we did. He kind of was big. I'll have to send you a picture of it, or I can probably do it on my phone right now and put it up here. But it was to the point where, like, we got we actually got chicken. 
we went to a farm, we got a chicken, brought out there, and we let the chicken sit around and out there, like, <laughs> walk around the outfield. We didn't, we didn't sacrifice the chicken, and we made him wear the chicken suit and shag BP for, for uh, the whole batting practice round. I'm going to see if I can't find a picture right now and put it on the screen. Hilarious. <laughs> but it's, like, little stuff like that, you don't, uh, you don't realize at the time, but what you're doing is you're creating, creating a friendship, you're creating yeah. bonds, you're creating things yeah. that, that you you take with you forever and guys guys love that they, yeah. they absolutely love that so uh and organizations love it too like okay the guys are they're starting to kind of rally around each other or they're kind of you know they're, they're all pulling in the same direction they're going through this together they're you know they're, they've lost 20 games this month we were in the we were in first place now we're in second place you know trying to fight to get back to the top and they're, they're doing little things like this they're, they're 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 real. They're real right. people. They're right. the human emotions are real thing. So it's kind of it's kind of cool to see that all that kind of stuff kind of happen in before your eyes. Well, especially in big leagues like that. Well, and the cool thing about it is too, Josh. I think that's just kind of, and I don't want to beat up on NFL players, the NFL. I mean, this is a non-controversial podcast, but mm-hmm. there is a difference. I mean, every time a center fielder makes a diving catch or robs a home run, he doesn't throw his glove down, do some weird dance, and say, hey, "For a moment, everybody, look at me for doing my job." Whereas in the NFL, like it used to be, like, okay, so. If you scored a touchdown, you spike the ball, and maybe you do a little bit of a celebration. But now it's like right. if a guy makes a tackle, he will run away from the crowd and yeah. act like he. It's like, yeah, that's what you were supposed to do. I mean, could you imagine right. if you had a celebration after every strikeout or every? You know, it just blows me. So in baseball, it does have much more of that. That just youthful team, and you got to have it. And we saw that. I think you know. Uh, when the Astros won the World Series, you know, yeah. a number of years back, to me, that's where it was on full display. I mean, just guys that rallied together. And I still remember back when was it ninety five and when Chipper and those guys won the uh, won the championship. Wasn't that ninety five? Gosh, man, yeah. Sam's, uh, you were only you were yeah, eleven years yeah. old, dude. Yeah. So uh, against the Indians. Yes, and so that was a you could just see the chemistry and so i, I could see that in a in a, in well, on, a paper, on a baseball team you go look at that that world series on paper cleveland was a better team by far mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just by absolutely paper wise the, 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 yep. the names on the on the roster they're yep. better they should have won right yep um but just before i get into that because i do want to talk about that i'll show you what i'm what talking oh, about that <laughs> got it right here and for the listeners, we're going to try to have this video up on the on the YouTube channel. You can always listen to the podcast. Josh and I are doing something new today where I'm actually I'm videoing it. I'm going to try to have our actual interview, the video, on YouTube as well so you can see it. So before you guys came on, you, you had two East Texans trying to figure out the the little <laughs> – figure out Skype. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that's that's that, that one. And then – like this is what we had him. This is the actual chicken we brought. So we put a little that's, cape on him, made him feel good. That's awesome. He has a little Cleveland cape, <laughs> but the chicken was unharmed. Absolutely, it was unharmed. But um, yeah, talking about the emotion of the game. There's there's a big epidemic right now in in, in baseball. Actually, the, the whole let the kids play thing, and I get it. Like it's 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 a great way to promote the game. Right. Great way to promote the game, but it. At, at some point, like the let the kids play is, it's a cop out, and I don't mean this in a negative way. It's a cop out to, he's not disrespecting somebody all the time. Right. There you are. You you hit a ball hard. You hit a ball over the fence, and you flip your bat up in the air. It's hey, look at me. Yep. Well, okay. You have twenty four other men on that team that are doing the exact same thing. They're 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 going about the business the exact same way. Yeah. Why, why is it you? Oh, look at me now. I hit a home run, or or I strike a guy out and dude's you know, shaking his hips or, or like, it's not, it's not let the kids play. It's, yeah. it's play the game with respect. Yep. The guy against the guy that you're pitching against, that you're playing against is, is putting in the same effort you are. Yep. He, he's not, he's not any different than you. He's not any better than you. He's not any worse than you. Show him the same respect that he, you're showing him. Yep. And I, and I, and I firmly believe that I actually had a situation this year. Um, uh, I got I got in the game. Um, one of our rookie pitchers, Jacob Webb, um, unbelievable numbers, unbelievable guy, unbelievable pitcher. Came into the game, he got nobody out. He had bases loaded. I came into the game, struck out two, 
got the last guy out, or struck out the or got the first guy out, struck out the next two guys, left all the drums on the on the board, and got a base loaded jam. Go the last pitch, strike three. Brian McCann's looking at me, and I'm pumped. I'm freaking ecstatic. I just, you know, say this rookie four runs again on on the on a DRA, and we were winning the game, and. I'm pumped up and, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, right. yeah, yeah. And, and raw, raw and go there. I don't want a target on my back. Right. But Brown McCann was like, I, I love that. You didn't show any kind of emotion. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I had, I had the emotion going in my head. I just don't like in, in that situation. If, um, if, if, if I, if I show that guy up, yep. that, that, that's disrespectful to me. I, I didn't, I wouldn't want him to do that to me. So why yeah. would I do it to them? Right. You know, and, and vice versa, hitting, hitting and things like that. And, um, I just think the game is pure. The game is lovely. You don't need to. You don't need to make the focus about you. It's about the game of baseball. Yeah. It's about the two teams playing. It's about the the Braves and the Indians. It's about the Dodgers and the Giants. It's not about you know, Josh Tomlin and uh, Francisco Lindor, Corey Kluber. It's not about those two guys clashing. To yeah. Make, to play against each other. It's about two teams playing. Right. You know. So it's that. That's where I. I, I don't. I don't agree with how the NFL celebrates and NBA yep. celebrates and things like that, or the MLB for that matter. Now I mean, it's becoming a thing in, in MLB too, where guys are hitting and they call it pimping home runs, where you hit it, you <laughs> bat flip, you know, throw your bat five miles in the air, right. and you walk to first base. Right. It's, right. It's, I get it's a different generation, different type of raw emotion that these kids have, but that's not raw emotion to me. That's that's that's. Everybody look at me. I've been the best for a long period of time. Watch me. Watch right. Me. Watch me. Hey. It's not, about, it's not about that. Brother, I'm with you. And, okay, so two things that you said that, that these thoughts came to my mind. One, going back to that Astros World Series victory, there was a lot of controversy that year in the NFL. I think that was the first year of the Colin Kaepernick deal. And, again, not going to go into that. Just It was very controversial, and there was a lot of – individual uh, attention being sought both, you know, from the celebration standpoint, plus some of the stuff that was going on is that surrounded that. And then you have this Dodgers Astros world series where it's a, where you just watch two teams battle it out. It had nothing to do with anything, but what you just said, the game and watching these guys just battle. And it was and in my mind, I thought at that time, and I, and I still believe this. I haven't looked at any numbers or statistics or ratings or anything like that from a from a media standpoint. But I told several people at that time. I said this World Series, given what's going on with the NFL, because baseball, America's pastime, but NFL now, I mean, Super Bowl Sunday has become like a national holiday. Mm-hmm. I said this World Series is going to do more for getting the attention of baseball fans than anything that's happened. In, in my in the last 20 years in my opinion because and I'm a guy I watched almost every inning of that World Series that was the first World Series I may have really watched that closely since the 95 World Series because not long after 95 when the players went on strike right as I was about to go into college uh-huh. I just got completely dismayed uh, and I was like I refuse to watch a game for the longest and I really I, I I hate that now because I didn't watch like Chipper Jones, who obviously you know, and was I, I didn't watch the end of Chipper's career, you know. And same with right. Will Will Clark was my was my player too. I never watched him play a Rangers game because I was just disenchanted after they went on strike. So fast forward to uh I guess what was that? The uh seventeen World 17. Series? Yeah. So the World Series 2017, I was like, man, this is awesome. We haven't seen anything like this in so long. And that's what I always loved about uh, uh, a baseball. And then the other thought that comes to mind is, I think it was Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect who first said it, but Steve Jobs always picked up on it, was, uh, and I'm, if I misquote this, forgive me, but I think I've got it right, simplicity is the height of sophistication. Just keep it, just, just the simplicity of it. Let your products, right. let your homes, let, let whatever your craft is speak for itself. And I tell you, an athlete that lived that principle out was Barry Sanders, man. Back when Barry Sanders was playing, playing football, if you'll remember, Barry Sanders would score a touchdown, hand the football over to the ref. You know, I did my job. I scored a touchdown and, 
and we remember he that. His teammates. Yes. Go hug his teammates. Yeah. Hug his line. It was like yeah. you guys. This is all us. You yes. Yes. And that's what we. That's what lives on. I think. Unless you're. Uh, I can't remember. Was it uh, Drew Pearson or whoever did the Quake as a cowboy? When we were kids. That was kind of like real showboat. And of course, that's back whenever I was a kid. You. Uh, it. So, but then all of a sudden. We're not going to be talking about in 20 years who did the greatest celebration. What gets no. the attention is that guy that played with just class and dignity. Uh, a guy that played the game, like I told you, was my childhood hero that you're with now, Dale Murphy. I mean, that was a right. guy that if ever, and I was so excited when you and I talked um, in preparing for the interview and you told me, you know, it's it's so cool because like you said, it's really neat to find out that your childhood hero that you look up to is the guy that you hope he is. And that's what you said okay. about Dale, which is so cool. That's 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 what the game is all about, and, and I can I can honestly got to tell you my fondest memories in this game are not about me, my personal stats. It's about things that I've accomplished with with a group of men, right? Um, playing baseball, and I'm glad you mentioned the 2017 World Series. We had one the year before that, um, Indians and Cubs, and it was yep. a team, two teams that had not been in the World Series, the two longest drought World Series champion teams of, in the history of the game, and it was. It was weird because it was that was one of the most watched games, most watched World Series in the history of the game, right? Yeah. And then it was, but it was also the next year he had the uh, Dodgers and the Astros, yeah. which surpassed what we did the year before right. that. Right. Right. And it was, it was cool because you had these two titans, old school baseball yeah. organizations play each other for to try to be the the, the next team to win, right? Then you got two powerhouse organizations with the. Uh, <laughs> Dodgers and the Astros, who were young and, and they had guys that were hitting home runs, and you have just dynamic players. We probably in '16, we probably didn't have the team on paper to go to the World Series. If you look at it, we just didn't. We didn't have the names. We didn't yeah. have the names. Say, you know, we had the we had some names. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, but yeah, they weren't they weren't household names quite yet. Right. And <laughs> we had guys, you know, cut their finger with the drone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had two pitchers. Me and Kluber had to go from from Boston to um, the end of game seven of the World Series, basically us two with the help of the bullpen, obviously. Um, and Trevor would, you know, I know he cut his, almost cut his pinky off, but he tried to go out there and pitch. We had, we had three guys that essentially took the ball to make those starts. And it, once we lost in game seven, <clears throat> I, I can't, I can't explain to you the, the hurt, the, like the disappointment, but also like the most proud I think I've ever been of a team. That I've ever played for. It, we, we stayed there until four o'clock in the morning from the owners to the bat boys to parking attendants to our wives to our kids to coaches. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't 25 men anymore. It was a city that endured this pain that, that was going through it with us. That yeah. was, it was, it was like anything I've never felt before. And it was, I understood at that moment that people make more of a difference than a person. Yeah. Does that make sense? A Absolutely. group of people make a lot more. They make a lot more difference. They make a lot more impact on a society, on a on a city, than that one person saying, "Look at me." Right. Hey, look at me. I just hit the ball 450 feet. Okay, great. I don't remember that. I guarantee you, people in Cleveland right now would go remember that 2016 team. Can tell you every 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 name on it. Um, we gave away 70 playoff full playoff shares, 675 full playoff shares, or something like that. To People that never, this life changing money. You know, we're, we're yeah. giving guys that work at a video room um, $185 to $200,000 because they were with us all year. Wow. They're, they're getting the same amount of money that we're getting. Yeah. That that kind of, that kind of team, team, or um, that kind of team, that kind of like selflessness that we have, it sticks with you. Yeah. You never forget those guys. And I text message those guys probably once. Every two or three days, we still all keep in contact. Wow! You know, all of our families are still friends. Our families go on vacation together. It's, it's something that you can't, you can never replace, and you always, you're always searching for that next best team, and um, that's like that. And well, I actually told Jacob Webb, the guy we were just talking about earlier, he asked me, he's like, "What do you think the difference in this team and the team you had in '16?" I said, "On paper, we're better." Yeah. That's all there is to it. On paper, we're better. Yeah. You know, we have that same. You know, drive. We had that same expectations of winning as we did in '16. Now all it takes is just building that that friendship, right? Along. And it, does, it didn't. You know, you can't develop them overnight. But you know, we're in a great, 
path of doing that. And um, that's what I told him, like, dude, enjoy the ride because this team has a, every every opportunity to win the World Series. And if you don't believe me, I was on a team that was, on paper, not as good as the team we are now. Yeah. We have one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. There's, let's be real honest. We're yeah. the most team in Major League Baseball. Yeah. We have some of the youngest talent that's the best talent in the I'm game loving right it. Now. I'm loving it. Fun to watch. <laughs> I'm loving it. Well, so, and that brings me to kind of where you are in your career now because you are a 14 year seasoned veteran, which, you know, let's face it. I mean, that means you are, you're, you're a senior in the league now. I mean, you, you've got the seniority. So therefore you've, you've garnered wisdom that these young players can benefit. And not only that, but you have had that World Series experience. So, what is your role as you see it in the clubhouse, and what do you try to do to help keep these younger players un- a cognitive of how important that chemistry and that all for one, that unification, how important it is? What do you see your role as a, in the clubhouse, and how do you how do you impart that to these these guys? You, you try to do everything you can. Like, uh- I, I understand. Like I, I do know where I'm at in my career. I, I've, I've I've been able to accomplish a lot of things that probably a lot of people never thought I'd be able to accomplish, and I'm proud of that. Don't get me wrong, but the most the proudest I can be is whenever I'm actually instilling something in a kid that can actually achieve the same same things that I was able to achieve, or more, or right. greater things than I was able to achieve. And I love I love that aspect of it. From every time I've been in Cleveland, from the time from my time now in Atlanta. I've always had one thing in mind and, and, and it's genuine to me and it really does mean something to me. And it's very rare you find that anymore, but that's kind of how I was taught whenever I got called up, whenever I was coming up with my laces. I, I, I generally care about my teammates. I want them all to be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, them being good makes me better, right? It's, it's just part of it. But seeing a kid come up, um, you know, back, back when I was in Cleveland, Shane Bieber, Tristan McKenzie, they would come and they would, the front office would make them shadow me and Corey Kluber. And once I, when, when I finally started realizing that, I was like, you know what, this is kind of cool that I, I'm not Corey Kluber. By any stretch, this dude is way better than me on the, on the mound. But they still want some of their prospects to shadow me along with him. Mm-hmm. And it was the testament to my worth ethic, to the things that I was able to accomplish being not your not the, not the type A pitcher I'm not, I'm not type a i'm not going out there throwing 95 plus and striking the world out i had to work for everything i've ever gotten right and um and i and i appreciate that aspect of it but these guys are following us and it's like okay i'm starting to realize like i you know, i need to pay attention to what these kids what i can get the best out of these kids because they're going to take over what i'm doing mm-hmm. they're going to take over my job eventually yeah so how, what kind of stuff can you teach these kids along the way to 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 make their transition seamless and to make your transition seamless for them also. And it's, they, they're not asking you to tell them everything to do. They just want to know, like, how do you do certain things? You know, how'd you get, how'd you get your routine? Okay. Well, just watch, watch the school about our business on a daily basis and, and see. And <clears throat> that's kind of where I'm at. And I, and I, I like that aspect of it because they they come and ask you questions and it starts you build a if you build a friendship you build a relationship you mm-hmm. build that that camaraderie that that you have to have in a big league clubhouse right and, um like hey how do you what do you what are you thinking about throwing Ryan Braun right here with my stuff or with your stuff <laughs> with my stuff like, what would you do if you were me <laughs> okay cool let's let's talk about it uh, that that's that stuff to me is cool because you, it, it gets you talking about baseball it gets you talking about things you've done in the past and it, like you reminisce about it, but um, you have to, the accountability aspect to me, I think is the greatest attribute a leader can have. And that's if I'm not doing my job and that doesn't mean I'm going to giving up runs and things like that. Like you're going to go out there and get the best effort. You're not going to win some days, period. Mm-hmm. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Those people have nice, they have big houses, they have nice cars too. They're good. Mm-hmm. They're very good. So you're going to fail. Obviously we talked about that. But the more I can teach you to stay in the same rhythm, stay in the same, you know, your routine doesn't change because of it. You know, your mentality doesn't change because of it. And if you're not putting in the work and I come up to you and talk to you about it, it shouldn't be like, you know, I'm doing something different because I gave up runs. 
you have to you have to stay the course. You have to stay. Baseball is a game of failure. It's. I'm trying to understand like how how I'm explaining this to the point where like. Some of these kids don't understand that they're going to fail a lot. Before yeah, they and they're not used to failing. Yeah. I imagine, right? right. That, yeah, they're I mean, still kind of new exactly. to. The, they've been they've been pretty freaking victorious all along, or they wouldn't be there. Exactly. So it, it is hard for them to get to, to, to get over that hoop. So I want them to be. If I come up to them and say, "Hey, man, get your butt in the weight room and let's get to work," they they better they can say the same thing to me. If I'm not if I'm not there, if I'm not accountable yep. for my own actions, why am I holding you accountable for your own actions? Right. So that that. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like the accountability aspect to me for a leader is if, if you're willing to tell somebody to do something that they need to they need to get their butt in order, hey, you know, stop going out so much at night. Mm-hmm. You better be doing the same thing. You better hold yourself in check for those same standards. If not, they're not gonna respect you or, or trust you at all. Right. Right. Man, I tell you what, man, Josh, you you're just you're you're just throwing wisdom all over the place today. <laughs> and what I'm serious because like one of the things that you mentioned there. It's so cool because the whole aspect of knowing who you are, and this goes back to kind of what you realized as a pitcher you, when you accepted, I am a pitcher. Now I'm going to go find those things. I'm going to learn enough about myself to figure out what I'm truly good at. And then what you just said there, how many executives or bosses or managers are asked a question, let's just say it's a sell, let's take it out of baseball. Let's say a sales rep comes, like my old days of owning real estate brokerages, a a realtor comes to me and says, how would you handle this prospect, this buyer, this seller? I'll be honest with you, man. I never would have thought to say, well, with my gifts or yours, you know, because you and I are two different people and the way I handle would handle it would probably be different than you. And it's so remarkable because at 34, You've got your head wrapped tightly around something that I am just now getting my head wrapped around because I've told people, like, I do a lot of mentoring and talking to um, undergrads and and do guest lecturing and that sort of thing. And I do mentoring for these kids that want to be entrepreneurs. And the thing that I have learned in the last few years that I try to tell them is, first of all, you have got to know who you are. And then when you figure out who you are, there's some things you're not going to like because those things you thought you were, just like you said, those things you thought you were really good at or Better yet, those things that you really wanted to be good at, the day you have to look at yourself in the mirror and go, that's what I love to do. That's what I want to be good at, but I'm not. I'm better at this. And so I've got to go hone that skill. That's a tough day, but you got to, you got to face it, right? It is, but it can change. It can alter the path of your life yeah. drastically to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, well, there's a, I think it's Mark Twain. Didn't he say like the greatest days in a man's life, the day he's born, the day realizes why exactly there's a, there's a quote that that's, i think it's mark twain yeah it is but it's that's so true though I mean, you can be destined I, I could love baseball I, I could be very very good at baseball but hate it yeah but understand like i have a family that i've been providing for and it's providing for that family i'm yep. really good at it I'm right keep doing it but i'm gonna I'm tra- train my hobby to come over here and do this yeah in, yeah in, in, in my spare time or things like that but i, I think like you said Understanding who you are as a human being is is so vital in in, in, in your success and your, the path of your life. That the quicker you can understand that, the better off you, you have it. You've got to be right. Absolutely, got to be better for it. And, yeah. Um, I, it was funny because I had a old pitching coach, Kenny Rowe. He used to call me Lefty, and he used to always tell me, "Lead the lady, uh, lead the lady, Lefty." I, I, I never understood what it meant. I never. <laughs> I never asked him that year, and as every time I went out to start an inning, he never told me any other thing. Right before I left the dugout to go to that lead the lady, and I was like, "What in the heck is he talking about? And why does he call me Lefty?" <laughs> and so we, I had Kenny Rowe, the very first pitching coach I ever had in the um, minor leagues. And the next year, I go to spring training, and I see him, and he's like, "Lefty," and I'm like, "What? Well, this dude remembers my name? This dude's been doing baseball for sixty years, lifer in baseball, been in the big leagues." And he's at the lowest bottom of the barrel minor league co- coaching and loving every aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I had opportunities to go p- to, to go be a pitching coach in big leagues and didn't do it. And uh, I, I finally asked him, I said, Kenny, why are you calling me lefty? He's like, because you'd be in the big leagues right now if you're left-handed. It's part of it. I was like, interesting. He's like, but you pitch like you're lefty, but you're righty. So we're going to have to work extra hard, right? Wow. I said, yeah. Wow. So lead the lady. I said, what do you mean lead the lady? What does that mean, Kenny? He said, lead the lady. He said, go, go get them. So what, lead the lady. He said, lead the lady for me in baseball 
go get the lead out. Lead the lady. Wow. Get her out. I said, okay. Why do you say that? He's like, well, if you want to put your best foot forward, right off the bat, right? Go lead the lady. Get the first out. Usually the first out you get an inning is the biggest out of you get an inning. Whether you believe it or don't believe it. I was like, all right, cool. So, like, little stuff like that. Just, yeah. Just take with you and you remember it. Um, he's in a – Kenny actually passed away not too long ago, but um, he's probably one of the bigger – impacts in my career that I made sure I told him a lot because he didn't care to get that. He yeah. never asked for that. He never wanted that. He just loved the game of baseball. He loved hanging out and talking shop, talking baseball. <laughs> and I could enjoy that and respect that. That's awesome. Well, all right, well, I've, I can't, I can't finish the conversation without talking about one of the most pivotal moments I've got to believe in your life was your Tommy John surgery. Mm-hmm. Okay, kind of take me to. And what year was that? That was that was 2012. Yeah, and it was it, I knew it was uh, quite a while back. But so, tell me, kind of right before the the, the when you whenever that you know the injuries there, you know, and Tommy John surgeries have now had we've had a lot of success, but still, it's got to kind of freak right. you out. So, kind of walk oh. me through that. Where was your head? And a lot of these things that we've been talking about, just how to get through games on the mound. Uh, I got to believe you had to deploy a lot of those skills just to mentally get through that. Kind of walk me through that phase of your professional career. It's, it's, it's almost like the worst day of your worst day of your career and a new look at your career at the same, mm-hmm. in the same day, in the same day. And Josh, talk, um, talk about, because I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just now thinking about this, you know, trying to learn learn as a good interviewer. There's people listening that have no clue what Tommy John surgery is. So kind of yeah. kind of talk about the actual injury and how they fix it because it was revolutionary. It's named after Tommy John because he was the first one right. that it, it was ever done and successful on, right? So kind of walk us through that a little bit. So Tommy John's were the UCL, ulnar collateral ligament that goes in your arm right through here. Right. Um, Pretty important for a pitcher. Form. Right. Very important. It's is is linked is connected is connects to the joint right so I mean it goes in and out there's mm-hmm. you can get through my scar yep um it's it's a ligament right yeah you see it's a ligament so they put a tendon back in there so the tendon doesn't produce blood at the, at the right off the bat so they have to re, basically go in there drill holes in your bones tie the tie the new ligament or tendon back there just to keep it stable mm-hmm. and then the, that's when the work begins it's it's well, okay. So before before I get to that, you can feel what happens in your elbow. It's usually one pitch. Something you feel something pop. It's almost like you like you pop your knuckle. Is it, what what is that? Why is that feeling like that? It kind of starts tingling, and you kind of understand like okay, maybe something's wrong. As a baseball player, real there. real quick, Josh. As a baseball player, because if that, if that happens to me out, you know, pulling weeds or something, I'm gonna think, oh, what's that? But as a baseball player, does it kind of, especially as a pitcher, does it kind of freak you out? Does your mind go, oh no, what if? Oh yeah. Okay. Especially because the next pitch you throw, I mean, I, I, I can remember doing it. I threw a slider, and then my next pitch, I threw a fastball, and I tried to throw it as hard as I could, and it was 82 miles an hour. I'm thinking to myself, what is wow. going on? Yeah. I, I, I've been throwing 90, 92, and something just happened. But you don't, you leave the game, you come out of the game, everyday life, it doesn't affect you. Yeah. But, so see, but on, grab the milk, you know, high five and buddies, you know, tossing a ball underhanded, like you don't. Everyday life, you don't really feel it. Right. But the second you go to baseball and you go to play, play catch, the second that that valgus stress gets put on your elbow, okay, your your pain sensors just start firing, right? It's mm. killing you. Um, but it's it's they take they took my ligament from this uh, wrist mm-hmm. and go like this right here, and you can see like the, there's a big tendon that comes through there. They usually put it in there, or they take your hamstring, a part of the tendon in your um, leg from your um, hamstring that you don't necessarily need, and they put it in there. Um, the recovery time is anywhere from one year to 18 months to two years, so depending on, you know, no setbacks and things like that. But um, you want to talk about monotony? That's monotony. You have the surgery, and you're in a cast for eight days, nine days. I say a cast, you're in a sling, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, they... They take you out of there, and then the next thing you do is kind of put you in a biomechanical arm that has degrees that kind of locked in on you, where you can only go a certain degree. Right. And to go a certain degree is they want slowly but surely. You can you see that? You just slowly but surely want you to just kind of like rotate mm-hmm. the, the arm out, flexing it out, or extend extension phase. Right. 
um, just to try to get that extension back. And that takes anywhere from four to six weeks on its own. And that's probably some of the worst pain because you're, you're constantly in a sling, right? And you're trying to get the motion back, but those tenons are so tight because they just installed them basically yeah. that it's hard to get that, to get them to kind of stretch, to kind of get them to, to be limber and move with you. Um, so that's probably the biggest part of it during that, during that time, the very first you know, six to eight weeks of that recovery is getting that extension to where you don't feel like it's hurting you anymore. Right. Um, but you don't start playing catch for, I want to say two, three, three, four months. You start playing catch and they want to, they want to start you off at like 45 feet, which 45 feet playing catch with the baseball is a nightmare <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> right. For, you know, the guy throwing. Right. Um, or the guy catching it, but um, then you just gradually move back and you start throwing bullpens. Then you start, you know, facing live hitters. And it's just, but the same workout you did the very first week of doing it, you're still doing it on the, you know, day 70. It's mm-hmm. just, now it's a warm up to you know, play catch instead of like an actual exercise to get your arm extended. Right. It's weird how it all, how it all plays out, but um, the success rate on it's, you know, astronomically good, but there's it's not a hundred percent yeah you know it's not it's not that that's the sad reality of it and so you, there's always that chance of it being the very last time you ever pick up a baseball did you ever have any doubt that you would make it back not a, a, never really never even in your mind i never i never awesome. allowed never allowed it to it, it there was times where I, I i had bad days yeah but i was very very fortunate enough to know that there was two or three guys that were in spring training the spring training complex in Arizona that experienced Tommy John before too. And they were still there. They were in like month six whenever I just had mine. So I asked them question after question after question, every single chance I could. So I knew when those situations occurred, I knew that it wasn't just me there. It occurred to, right. Um, I wasn't an outlier of the fact of, Oh God, I'm, I'm not, I'm not coming back. I actually got back a lot quicker than I probably should have. Yeah. But, um, I didn't have the luxury of being a top prospect where I could just kind of milk it, milk it and, and have buy myself an extra year, you know, <laughs> right. to get back as quick as I could and, and try to get to, get to compete and try to get to the big league. Wow. Wow. Well, and so, and thank God you did, man, because I mean, I, I just, I, again, that's gotta be one of those things where it's, it's one thing if you're a high school athlete or, you know, like I didn't get to keep playing baseball because I, I cracked a bone in my wrist playing football. And so I never got to play my senior year. I wanted to be a pro ball player. I have no idea whether I would have been good enough, but I, I had, you know, scouts looking at me whenever I was younger and that sort of thing. And I was like you, I just, I did not want to play football. I only wanted to play baseball, but my dad really, really liked football and I really, really liked pleasing my dad. So yeah. I kept playing football. And so it's one thing when you're that age, but whenever it's your livelihood, that's got to be a scary deal. So it's really cool that because I think you just, again, you express kind of your mental toughness is that in this instance, failure is not an option. I'm going to get back. Right. I'm going to be a success story. And ultimately you were. Well, and that's kind of that's kind of my fault. I didn't have really have a choice. The only thing I've ever known in my entire life was baseball. Baseball yeah. and working. You know, right. I, was, I, I didn't I didn't know anything other. I wasn't wasn't good at math. I wasn't good at science, <laughs> history. I had a terrible memory. You know, yeah. I just I wasn't a very studious person. I right. Mean, I wasn't a dummy by any means, but um, I would have much rather been outside than sitting in the classroom. I've, yeah. I've been that way my entire life. Um, so it was the only thing I knew. So it was either you know, buck up and get it done. Right. Or you're going, you're going to have to go manual labor the rest of your life. Yeah. And not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. You know, my family was, I was, that's how I was raised. Yeah. Um, I was actually had to do that my entire high school, you know, all through high school, all through yeah. college. Same even here. in the minor leagues, I'd come home and have to do it. Yeah. Um, cause you weren't getting paid any money. You had to work. Right. But I had a vision in my mind of what I wanted my life to be and how I wanted my kids to be raised and how one of my, um, my life, what direction I wanted my life to go. And I, I was kind of hell bent on trying to make that happen, regardless of the status of being drafted or um, the status of throwing hard and things like that. The, you know, the model of, of guys pitching in the big leagues nowadays is you got to throw 95 plus and if yeah. you don't, you'll never make it. It's just simply not true. Yeah. And I didn't want to believe and I wasn't going to believe it. So, um, but that's, that's kind of the mindset I've had to have for my entire life and it's worked out. <laughs> Well, and now 
it, yeah, I'd say it's worked out pretty well. And I'd say also it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a very good advice to be determined and know, and, and again, know your priorities, know what you got to do and go out there and execute, right. which is what you just said. Well, all right. So I'm just, I'm kind of laughing at myself here because right over my shoulder, and I know that Carly follows me on Instagram. Let me see if you can see this. Right over my shoulder. Let me see if you can see. There's my Peloton. So if, oh, yeah. I love the Peloton. Uh, okay. So anybody that knows anything about me lately is I'm addicted to Peloton. I do intermittent fasting. And I'm kind of laughing because I'm thinking, you know, you've got all these guys like me. like, And a lot of the guys that are going to see Bobby Stroop here in, in Tyler – that we're trying to keep our bodies like as as though we're professional athletes. It's really kind of funny how it's become. It's like so many people like with CrossFit and all this stuff. You're an actual professional athlete, so you know you really have a reason to. So, kind of, what does your uh, fitness regimen look like? Do you do anything like to, can, especially now, to to maintain the sustainability? I mean, what are you doing? I. It's funny because the older you get, the more things change, especially in this, especially in baseball industry. Um, yeah. There's always new things coming out. I, I really couldn't tell you anything drastically I try to do over mm-hmm. the course of, of actual training from the time I was 20 years old to the time I'm 35, 34 years old now. Um, you know, Bobby could probably tell you the same thing. Is he tries to probably back me off a little bit more than anything. Bobby and Kai Heck and uh, Connor, they – they're, they try to kind of like get you to pull off, pull back mm-hmm. a little bit now, the older you get, um, instead of, instead of being, you know, constant in a constant state of recovery or trying to recover because you're constantly doing things. Mm-hmm. It's more of the recovery aspect of it might be better than the actual strengthening act, act, aspect of it now. Um, but I, I just like to keep my body moving right now. Right. Um, I, I feel like I put in a lot of a lot of work and a lot of hard work in the off season to get big and to get strong and to get fit and to get in the to get your body. It's weird for baseball players, right? I, I don't want to look like a body like Gronkowski. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to look like Gronkowski. Don't be wrong, but I'm saying <laughs> right. like in the aspects of my body doesn't function or move that way. Right. As a, as a pitcher. Yeah. Um. But I, I, once you get your body back balanced, being uh-huh. that. You're not because I'm a one dimensional athlete. I, I, I move in one direction. I'm one directional athlete, I should say. I move in one direction constantly. Mm-hmm. The same motion over and over again. I don't want to train that body to be in that, that motion constantly. I need to get that body back to its normal state so mm-hmm. it has a better elasticity to be able to perform. And Bobby and Kai and Connor do a great job at APEC to get your body back to where it's normal state. The way you can stay healthy and sustain that. I'm not trying to go from Josh Tomlin to the Hulk in two weeks. Right. I'm just trying to keep my body moving, keep limber, keep stretched out, um, you know, and, and make strength gains when you can. Like, obviously, having strength mixed into your workout regimen is obviously huge. And, um, but the sleep habits, um, the drinking habits, the mm-hmm. things like that, that that go on in the course of the year are – especially as you get older, you have to pay a lot more yep. attention to. Yep. Uh, the sleep is probably the most – important aspect of it and sometimes you get it sometimes you don't so you just kind of listen to your body and um understanding when i go into a ballpark like i go in there today i slept pretty good last night i'll probably work out yeah but if i didn't i'm gonna go in there and go you know what i'd rather get on a norman tech machine um or a crowd chamber get in the cold tub do, do little things like that just to get your body to kind of get out of that state of mm-hmm. of trying to recover right get moving get get your body just do something and yeah. um i think that's where i've been in the past few days is or not the past few days past few years is listening to bobby listening to kyle and connor about the importance of not just working out but sleep yeah eating habits things like that how how beneficial they are and um but i gotta be honest with you peloton i'm, I'm a huge huge peloton guy i love it <laughs> and i've never thought i'd do I, ha- I hate running i absolutely cannot stand running well uh, okay so do you have the treadmill no, I don't have I don't have any of them right now. I'm at okay. the ballpark. That's what I use them on. But I'm gonna okay. get I'm gonna try to get two of them for me and Carly to get yes uh, put in our house. All right. Well, whenever you get one, then I want you to look me up so we can ride together. You know, because uh, oh, you've you. got the treadmill and the bike. I haven't done the treadmill yet, but I, the the bike I'm all over it. And it's it's so cool that you said the whole thing about sleep being so important to recovery because Matt Wilpers, who is he's a Georgia boy actually, and uh, he's my favorite 
Peloton instructor. I, t- I took one of his classes at 5 a.m. this morning, as a matter of fact, and he's constantly <laughs> preaching that. He's like, literally, the best form of recovery is sleep. It's not mm-hmm. ice baths. It's you can, you know, those are awesome things, but just get sleep. And, uh, right. and that's been one of my, I mean, I've always been, I've been kind of like, you know, I'm 44 going on 64. I'm, I'm ready to go to bed at like seven thirty, eight o'clock. <laughs> so it's kind of easy for me, but, uh, but a lot of people don't realize that, that, you know, just, and, and the older you get, and I've got 10 years on you, you're right, man. I like, I cut, I completely cut, uh, alcohol out of my diet, uh, a year ago, not for scruples or, you know, tr- or trying to be a teetotaler for any other reason other than the fact that I'm getting older and it makes me fat and it slows me down. That's it. Yeah, so it don't feel good in the morning. No. I can't stand, I can't stand waking up in the morning going, not hangover, but I'm right. still alcohol headache. That drives me nuts. Right. I, right. You can't be the best version of yourself that day when you're like that. I mean, exactly. And, and I, hate, I hate feeling that way. I hate feeling uh, restricted, I guess, yeah. for lack of a better term. But, um, no, I hear you. Sleep is, is huge, and um, it's difficult when you f- first have like two. Uh, my my girls five and four. They sleep in the bed with us. Yeah, or four four and three. I'm sorry, they'll be five and four. Um, and another one on the way that's going to be doing the same thing, sticking with us. But it's you have to figure out a way to get more sleep. And I've, I've actually talked to sleep doctors about this. This is how important it is. Like these teams hire sleep doctors to come in and talk to you. Really about the benefits of sleep. Wow. And. I, I remember him telling me, like, you know, you never wanted to take a nap whenever you were in kindergarten and first grade. The teachers tell you to go take a nap. A 30-minute nap is one of the most beneficial things you can do throughout the course of the day for yep. your body. Yep. I had no idea about that. Yeah. I go, just go like – we have sleep rooms in our clubhouse. Wow. We have two, two or three rooms that are designed to be pitch black with bunk beds that you go in there – they have these electrodes that hook up on this light that, that shine certain types of lights that's supposed to help in recovery and like meditation and things like that. It's like they hire people to help you sleep better. Wow. They, the benefits of it just makes, it makes you that much better as, a, as an athlete, though. Well, John D. Rockefeller took naps every single day. Uh, Winston Churchill, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, literally went to bed, then got up, took a bath, started the day all over again. I didn't know this till here recently. The most successful member of my family ever was my great grandfather, Mac Merrill. He would come home. He owned a car dealership in Sulphur Springs. He was a Chevrolet dealer. He would come home at lunch and literally take his clothes off, go to the guest bedroom, take a nap, get dressed and go back to the dealership. I mean, there is a correlation with sleep and, and success. So, so it makes sense. Well, all right, Josh. Well, man, I've taken so much of your time. This has been awesome. But there's one question that I got to ask you because I ask every one of my my guests uh, in Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's a chapter in there where he talks about one day you find yourself walking by a church and you hear music coming from it. So you follow the uh, you follow the music into the church and you walk in. You realize you're at a funeral. And as you walk up to the uh, to the casket, you realize it, you're at your own funeral. And at this point, Covey actually has the reason to put the book down right now and decide what do you want said about you when this life is over. And so that's my question for you, Josh. At this point in your still relatively young life, but I mean – your senior, you're you're at that you're at that yeah, like I said, you're at that senior level position. And by by senior, I don't mean old. I just mean wisdom. Where you are in your right. major league baseball career, when it's all said and done, what do you want said about Josh Tomlin? He showed up. Wow. He he showed up every day with a with so with the will to work, the opportunity to get better, the to, to try to get better, and to try to make everybody around me better. I, I've, I've always been that way. I've always tried to help people. My wife, my wife, gives, Carly will give me, you know, she, she goes nuts sometimes about some of the things they're like, she's like, just worry about us for a little bit. Worry about us for a little bit. <laughs> Not everybody else. Don't go to the ballparks early today. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I understand that. And, I, and that, that's something I've always had to work on and had to be better at. But um, showing up, being being accountable, being there for, for, for everybody, not just, you know, certain guys on a team that talk to you or certain guys are your friends and show up to the guys that are your enemies. Also, you, you know, your foes, or if people have questions, they have be, be, just be there, be, be ready to be show up and be accountable. And 
I think that the more we're able to be to be there for somebody when they need it to be, the more likely they're going to be there for you whenever you need them to be. And I, and I firmly believe that. I believe that the universe has a weird way of working that way, and God has a weird way of putting people in your life to the point where you need these people in your life. You need to make them better. If you can't lift them up, then why? what are you, what are you doing around them anyway? Right. You're not trying to bring anybody down, are you? You're trying to lift everybody up. And um, to be able to do that, you have to show up, and you have to be ready. And that's something that I, I, I learned that a lot in pro ball and, and learned it more now than anything, anything else. Is if, if I was that type of teammate or husband or father that only showed up when it was convenient for me, I wouldn't be very good. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be very liked, very respected. And um, I wouldn't have 24 guys on the team that, that were, you know, that enjoyed having you around or that could come talk to you. You know, if I have a Tuki Toussaint who's one of the younger um, players in this team that has a question for me and I'm not there, I have a hard time living with that. It, it's to the point where I, it's going to drive me nuts. So yeah. just show up. And if he has your question for you, answer it the best you can. Doesn't always have to be the right answer, but it, it, the other day I, I can remember that this is just an example. I'm not trying to take this and run with it, but he, Tuki had a, had a had a rough one. I had a rough one. I go in the video room. I see him in there. I just go sit next to him. He's like, "Wait, what? Why did you come sit next to me?" I was like, "Just in case you had a question." He goes, "You like, hey man, what what am I doing? <laughs> ask it. If you don't, then I'm. It doesn't matter. You didn't, you didn't want to ask me a question mm-hmm, at that mm-hmm. point, but I'm going to always show up." Wow. So if you ever have anything you need to get from me, I will always be there. And I then I try to make, live that same life for my wife and my kids. And that's the that's the one thing you you can't control, right? Just show up. Wow. Be ready. Well, brother, I tell you what, you showed up today. This has been an incredible conversation, I Josh. Man, I am so very grateful. I do hope it was fun for you because it means the world to me. As I've I mean, literally, this podcast is only going to be as successful as the the people that I introduce the audience to, and I got to believe that they are going to be so thrilled. Those that don't, that even the ones that do know you, because you know all of our folks around here in East Texas, are, I, I hope are going to listen to this, and those that don't know you uh, are going to know you know you for the first time. Those who do know you are going to know you better, and man. I'm just so grateful for you taking the time, brother. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I purposely wanted to make this about you and not go completely off on the Braves, but let's just go ahead and mention you guys are kind of crushing it this year. I mean, you're just ridiculously talented, like you said earlier. No doubt about it, Jason. Unbelievable team. Unbelievable team, too. Like, yeah, but... Anywhere from 21 years old to 35 years old, 36 years old. I think Bartekas is the oldest one. And everybody loves each other. It's crazy, but it's a lot of fun to be around, and it's something special. I think um, you we could be seeing the the Bravos in the Fall Classic oh, this year, and man. I firmly believe that. Man, I, all right, I'm going to hold you to that, brother. That would make my day. And by the way, probably it, facing the Astros, to be honest. Yeah, and w- wouldn't that be cool? Because I told you, you know, the first time I ever got to see the Braves was my granddad took me to Houston to watch them yeah. play the Astros, and that's when I got my heroes autograph on a little ticket envelope, Dale Murphy. And so, be sure if you run into. Del Murphy, tell him that one of his, someone that he was a hero to, both on and off the field as a child, interviewed you today, and uh, and it. just and just to and you know what? It sounds cheesy, but man, you know, thank him for the example for because to me, he's he was that old school ball player that just like you said, he just showed up and did the work. And the guy starts as a catcher, you know, he he plays mm-hmm. first base, he played, and then ends up being a dynamic center fielder. You know, I mean. Yeah. Guy was just awesome, and so, you know, if you just just tell him, say, hey, there's a dude in Texas I talked to today back home that just just thinks you you hung the moon. I right. love it. He'll enjoy that. All right, brother Josh, I'm gonna push the uh, stop button on the record real quick and uh, tell you once again, man, thank you so much for this time. Oh, this is a blast! I'll do it anytime you want. All right, brother. I love it. it <laughs> awesome. Thanks. 
Hey folks, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Texas Titans podcast. Before you go, I wanted to let you know where you can find us out there on the interwebs. You can go to show notes as well as listen to all the past episodes and look for upcoming uh, shows at texttitans.blog. Also, that has all the different formats that you can listen to the show on if you go there. So texttitans.blog. You can also go to jasonrightnow.com. That has not only a link to the podcast, but it also has a link to my Make Your Own Rules blog that I think you'll enjoy, so please check that out. Also, it has information about my executive coaching business, speaking, and anything else like that. So jasonrightnow.com. That's literally just my name, jasonrightnow.com. On Twitter, I'm at jasonrighttx. I would really appreciate a follow. I have not been a big Twitter user, so I need you guys to help me with that. So please uh, take the time to go out to jasonrighttx, find me, and follow me. I'm trying to get more active with it. And so if you'll engage with me, I'll try to do a better job of engaging with you. So I would appreciate that. And then on Instagram, I'd really appreciate a follow follow there. I'm at Jason right now. Again, my name now. So please follow me on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I'm also at Jason Wright TX. So check us out there. I'm, and I'm also on LinkedIn. So look for me there. I try to use as many platforms as possible to let you know about upcoming shows, past shows, and then also just anything that I find interesting. I'm trying to push it out and get better with the social media. So please check us out out there and follow us. I would be most grateful. And also, please do not forget, it means the world to me for you to go to iTunes, give us a rating. Right now, we've got that five-star rating. I'm hoping to hold that. Please, please, please. The comments that people are writing are so very kind. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. And that's how we keep moving up in the ranks. And right now, we're crushing it with downloads. The show has really had incredible feedback, thanks to you guys. So I'm grateful. Please keep that momentum going by giving us a, uh, a review on iTunes. Thanks so much, and have a great day. And as always, I could not be more grateful for you listening. Thanks.